from stumbling stones to stepping stones. If I were to take a large stone about that wide and that deep and about this thick and put it in front of your feet and you fell over it, what would you call the stone? Not sort of what language would you use, what, would you, what sort of a stone would it be, would you say? A stumbling stone, wouldn't it? All right. Now, if I took the same stone, same width, same depth, same thickness, and put it in front of your feet, and you stepped on it, what would you call that stone? A stepping stone. All right. Now, the interesting thing, then, that we have to determine is... What's the difference between the two stones? Because in fact, it's exactly the same measurement, same thickness, everything about it is exactly the same. The same person put in front of your feet, you can blame me for that. What's the difference between a stepping stone and a stumbling stone, then? They both have to be in front of your feet for either job, don't they, as to whether you stumble or step. Uh, but I put the same stone, exactly the same stone in front of you. I put it down there and it... So the difference is ours, isn't it? how we use it. The same, the, the same stone is there. This is the point I'm trying to make. I realize, sorry, Brother Tomatis, I know what you're getting at, but we put the same stone there, the same person puts it there, on one occasion it stepped on, and the other occasion it stumbled over. Whose fault is it? We would have to say it's how you use the stone. Because if you look in front of you and see a stone there, you can either use it as a stepping stone or as a stumbling stone and that the only difference is as to whether you decide to fall over it or walk on it. Up to you, isn't it? And that's what we want to discuss this morning, how we could turn some of what appears to be stumbling stones into stepping stones. Now the Bible allows us to have sufficient license to discuss this subject this morning because in the book of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, Jesus Christ is referred to as a stumbling stone. Now, I'm not suggesting this is the interpretation of the text, but the principle for our discussion comes from here. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Now, it begins by saying, Coming to him... As to a living stone, rejected, it is true, by men, but chosen, precious with God, you yourselves also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house for the purpose of a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For look, it is contained in Scripture. Look, I am laying in Zion a stone, chosen, a foundation cornerstone, precious, and no one exercising faith in it will by any means come to disappointment. Now notice about this stone as we read on. It is to you, therefore, that he is precious, because you are believers. But to those not believing, the identical stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock mass of offense. A stone of stumbling. Now why are they stumbling? These are stumbling because they are disobedient to the word, to this very end they were also appointed. So here's Jesus Christ as a stone, the same Jesus Christ, hewed and cut out of the same rock, if you like, and to us who believe, he is a foundation cornerstone chosen, precious by God. 
that the same Jesus Christ given by the same Jehovah God is a stone of stumbling and a rock mass of offence for those not believing. Is it the fault of the stone? Is it the fault of the one who gave the stone? Or is it the fault of the ones who are using the stone that make it either a stumbling stone or a stepping stone, if you like? Something to be built on or something to fall over? Now, from time to time, of course, um, we hear of people who get stumbled. You may even have been stumbled yourself. And you hear people say, um, I was at the Kingdom Hall the other day and uh, brother or sister said so and so and so and so and, and I'm stumbled. Or somebody goes around to visit somebody and they haven't been coming to Christian meetings or engaging in some Christian activity for a while and they say, oh, well, you see, uh, so-and-so stumbled me, and that's why I'm not coming. So here is the person with their face flat in the mud, having fallen over a stone. But indeed, that very same experience that they had could have been a stepping stone. So in what way do you think that we could turn a stumbling stone into a stepping stone. Here somebody comes along, they throw a stone in front of you and they say, there, fall over that. And you say, thank you very much. And you walk on it. Well, we could illustrate it, if you like. Uh, it's a matter of how we are being moulded today and uh, what we are learning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15 which we won't discuss because it takes at least an hour to discuss it, uh, it mentions about fire-resistant Christians. Right? You might recall the text. And it mentions about people who build on um, precious stones, gold or silver, or people who build on wood, hay, stubble. Now it says the fire, which happens to be the destruction of Babylon the Great, will prove what sort of work each one did. Now, the inflammable Christian, the one who builds on wood, material, hay, and stubble, is what is known as a doctrinal Christian. Just telling you quickly so we can move off this point. That is a person who knows the truth here. But they are the ones who get burned in the fire. The one who is a fire-resistant Christian, the one who builds on gold, silver, and precious stones, is one who allows his personality to actually be changed by the truth. Right? Now when the end comes, which uh, we understand it is much sooner than we all realize, the survival of us will depend not upon our ability to answer 27 scriptures on the Trinity or some other written review. It will be determined on as to whether our personalities have altered whether we now have the fruits of the Spirit or not. And if you want to have something to do very quickly and dramatically now to make sure of your survival, give some attention to the person that's sitting on your own knee, you, and uh, maybe do something about that personality. And if you're not sure that you've got any faults, ask somebody else. They'll tell you about them. And uh, if you say you haven't any faults, well, of course, conceitedness is what you've got to work on straight away. Now, this, coming to this point, now we're going to understand uh, why certain things are happening the way they are in the congregation. So, may I illustrate it? We'll say a sister. Always like to, I, I like to talk about the sisters when my wife isn't here. <laughs> Let's say we have a, a sweet, lovely sister and she has a sore toe. Have you ever had a sore toe? You know what it's like, maybe. And uh, she's been down to the doctor and She's had it all bandaged up and it's terribly tender and she's even cut a hole in the top of her slipper because she can't even get a shoe on. Cuts a big hole in the top of her slipper to let it pop out, you know. And she comes to the meeting. It's a bit crowded here, isn't it? So she comes in the door and she comes very carefully, pushing everyone out of the way, watch my toe, you know. <laughs> Don't come near me, you know, careful. And she's very worried about it. You understand why. So she drives her toe with her coming behind down here and she sits very nicely here in a nice convenient spot somewhere. All goes well. Meeting is over. She gets up 
And she got through the crowds, no problem. A lot of people have gone. And there she is, standing right there, plenty of room, no one near her. And Sister Plumsy comes up to speak to her, just comes up and goes, boom. <laughs> well, after we drag the poor sister back down off the ceiling, where she'll probably go as she hits the roof, we bring her down here. What she is saying and muttering and exploding at this time is unprintable, unrepeatable, and we hope ununderstandable. And uh, so we don't get any sense of her and out of her. And we see her going out there in a steam of smoke, and that's it. And you say, well, I understand how she is. So a day or two later, when she cools enough, the one of the brothers will go around to see her. And um, you probably pull up out the front, and you can still see the steam on the windows uh, where she has been fuming for a few days. And you'll walk to the door, and uh, he'll get a reply Something like this. I don't know what you've come for. Guys, you can't tell me. No, I'm not going to listen. No, you can't tell me she didn't do it on purpose. I know. Look, the hall was empty. There was only a room. She just came and deliberately put a foot right on my toe. Now, look, that's the most unchristian thing that I've ever heard of. Now, look, people in the old world don't do that. I went down to the supermarket the other day at my hotel. And, you know, I went around that supermarket and all those crowd of people there. And they put a foot on my toe. And I got to Kingdom Hall and I could put on my toe. And, and uh, it wasn't that, uh, it was no accident. Look, whatever, there's people like that going to that Kingdom Hall. Why do, I'm never going in that Kingdom Hall again, whatever she goes there. I don't know why you allow her to go there. All right. So she's a little upset, you see. We say she has been stumbled, rather literally. Huh? Now you say, all right, that's a pretty fair situation, isn't it? Here we have a good stumbling stone. We have a sister flat with her face in the mud. And you say, that could have been a stepping stone? That could have been a stepping Yes, it could. How? Well, let's examine the situation for a moment. Now, we said earlier that that sister is going to get into the new order on the basis of whether or not her personality has changed. Right? Now, that sister is like most of us. We imagine we've changed. I do, too. You know that when I'm at home with all the doors shut in a room, on my own, reading the Bible, I have a lot of the fruits of the Spirit. But my trouble is I've got to come out of that door sometime, and I've got to meet up with people. And from time to time, you have dramatically demonstrated to you that you don't have as much of the fruits of the Spirit as what you imagined you have. Now, this sister here that has a sore toe imagines she has the fruits of the Spirit. She's not working on them. She's not doing anything about them whatsoever. She's drifting along, and the day will come, and she'll find out she was an inflammable Christian. That's that she will be burned. Uh, a flammable Christian, and uh, because she didn't change her personality. Now, what are the fruits of the Spirit she's lacking? What you say when we pulled her off the roof? What are some of the things? Self-control. Yes. Obviously, she couldn't suffer very long, could she? <laughs> long suffering is an obvious one. Joy, she's lost her joy. Mildness, she wears it gone. Endurance, right? Peace, yeah, she hasn't got much peace, obviously. Right? Just, just, just about this. Yes. Kindness, right. So just about all of them have gone clear out the window. She has a good job to work on about nine qualities by the look of it. Now, if she sees this, if she goes home instead and says, well now look, Jehovah God allowed a very interesting thing to happen to me tonight. He showed me clearly and plainly that I do not have long suffering sufficiently. I do not have self-control. I do not have peace, I do not have love, I do not have joy, so I will just have to set about and work on it, or otherwise I won't survive. Just as plain as that. So she works on it, she gets out her Bible, she reads about self-control, she prays about it, she gets Holy Spirit, she keeps reading her Bible, praying about this quality and the qualities that she needs, 
the measures of the Holy Spirit converge on her heart, change the personality, and the end comes and Jehovah God says, right, beautiful fire-resistant Christian into the new order, no problem. Who was her best friend? Who was her very best friend? The one who trod on her toe. The one that she screamed about, said she's the worst person she ever met, old world people are not as bad as her, and all the horrible things she said about her, actually saved her life when she sees it as a stepping stone instead of a stumbling stone. Of course, if this sister does go around jumping on people's toes on purpose, she obviously has a problem of her own to work on, (laughs) and she'd better work on it. But regardless of what the motive is, regardless of why people do it, if people come along and they are really, they hate you, and they throw down that stone and say, there, fall over that, and then you say, yes, thank you very much, I didn't want to walk in that mud, and you step on it very nicely, because there is no stumbling stone that cannot be a stepping stone if you're serving Jehovah God. And that's what you sung about when we started, didn't we? No stone will make you stumble if you serve God faithfully. There is no such thing if you see the situation correctly. You see, here we are in this situation. I I don't know if you've ever tried to analyze a congregation of people, but uh, you look around sometimes at Deer Park congregation. What a variety, isn't there? You know that if it wasn't for the truth, most of us would have never even met him in a whole lifetime. Can you imagine in what circumstances you would have met if it hadn't been for the truth? Most of us never would. Now what God could do, if he wanted to, he could go right around the world and he could select 60 or 70 people that have personalities similar to yours, just say you as an individual. And he could make up a congregation of 60 people like you and they looked at everything the same way, they had the same outlook, same environment, same background, same frustration, same inhibition, same fears, same everything. And you would live happily together, wouldn't you? You'd never have an argument, no one would ever rub anyone up the wrong way, nobody would ever cause any problem, the whole congregation would go happily, peacefully on into its destruction at the destruction of Babylon the Great. Why? Because no one would have changed you'd have seen no reason to change. And do we have to change? You're not convinced of that yet. You think you've made it already. But we have to change, don't we? And unless we have brought home to us wherein we have to change personally, we're doing nothing about it. We're just drifting along, imagining that we're absorbing certain changes as and when they're coming. But what are we doing about it in a practical way, about doing something about our personalities? So Jehovah God doesn't do that. He said, if you're not going to change, he'll make sure you do. So he brings together the Deer Park congregation, and he gets a lot of people from all different backgrounds and environments, even uh, countries of birth and so on, and he puts you together in one congregation. And uh, standing from here, as many of your brothers and sisters have done, and looking out here, there, you can see the variety. You do rub one another up the wrong way sometimes, don't you? Do bump into each other, tread on a few toes, a few corns from time to time. There are a few people hitting the roof from time to time. Why? That's by design. Don't pack up and get out of the congregation because you're having some problems. Turn that stumbling stone into a stepping stone. Jehovah God is showing you the qualities for you to work on. Don't run away from it. Don't say, uh, there are too many sisters and brothers in the congregation who don't love me, so I'm going to move away to Timbuktu or somewhere. Because when you get there, you'll be the same sort of a congregation, the same problem. May I illustrate it this way? In the field of lapidary, when you take stones, uh, semi-precious stones, uh, they don't look too nice, do they? Have you ever seen them in the rough state? Now, the way that they uh, polish them and bring out the beauty in them 
is that they take those stones, all shapes, sizes and descriptions, and they place them in a barrel. And they take some paste and they toss it in the barrel and they spin the barrel around. And do you know what takes place? The barrel keeps spinning and spinning and spinning. The stones, the stones grind each other and polish each other and the shape changes and the rough edges are knocked off and that gradually when the grinding goes on long enough you take out of that barrel beautifully polished precious stones. That's how lapidary operates. Now, uh, when Jehovah God uh, sees you, he sees you as a desirable precious stone. Haggai chapter 2 mentions this, that he brings out from the nations all the precious things because he wants to beautify his temple. So the other sheep class, the great crowd, are the stones with which he wishes to beautify the temple, so he has to grind them. So he places this in a congregational barrel, and he takes a great big handful of love, throws it into the barrel, and spins it. And we rub, grind, and knock rough edges off each other, until finally we become the beautiful polished Christians that he sees in us after these edges and bits and pieces are gone. Now can you imagine, if you were a stone in that barrel, what would you feel the most? When you knocked a rough edge off another stone, or when another stone knocked a rough edge off you? Which would affect the stone more? Well, when the piece knocked off you, you'd feel it, wouldn't you? So isn't it always the case that in any sort of a dealing, you may be knocking rough edges off others by inadvertently hurting their feelings and they're making allowances for you and being understanding and patient, but are you doing the same for others? Are you allowing that when the chip goes off you, you say, well, there's another rough edge gone off me. Here is another opportunity to let another facet of my polished Christian personality shine. Does a rough diamond look any good? We're all rough diamonds, aren't we? We're lovely people, except you can never see it off on the surface. And the only way you can ever get a diamond to look nice is to cut it, isn't it? And uh, after it's been cut and polished, then what does it look like? Does it have light in itself? No, it actually reflects light, doesn't it? We are not the source of light, but light as Christians, but we reflect the light from Jehovah God. We reflect it rather dull, in a dull way, until we are cut and polished. And this is the process of being in a congregation. This is what's happening to us every day. And this is why these so-called stumbling stones can become stepping stones to us without any difficulty. It, to uh, also substantiate the point that we mentioned, that if you're in a congregation of people that didn't have this effect on you, if you take stones that are already polished and put them in a barrel and spin them around, they don't affect each other. When you take them out, they look exactly the same, as you'll know in lapidary. So it's only in the rough state that chips and pieces are being knocked off. And if there is something to be knocked off you, if you can still get upset, then that means that you aren't finished in your polishing yet. Something still needs to be done. Start to look at it from a different point of view. Because in 1 Peter chapter 5 it says, God himself will finish your training. Right, <laughs> by putting you in the congregation at baptism and then making sure that the personality starts to develop. We have some very interesting examples in the Bible about it, and uh, I'd like to just take time out to tell you a little bit about the life story of one person in the Bible who you may be able to identify with in some of his circumstances, and this man's name is Barnabas. Who else's name do you think of when you think of Barnabas in the Bible? Which name do you put first? How do you say it? You usually say Paul and Barnabas, don't we? Do you know why? That's not alphabetical order, is it? <laughs> well, let's go back and have a little look about Barnabas. Barnabas was not named Barnabas. That wasn't his name at all. His name was Joseph. Now, Joseph <coughs> was a Jew 
which you can read in Acts chapter 4, verse 36 and 7. He was a Jew, and he was born in Cyprus. It says there, So Joseph, who was surnamed Barnabas by the apostle, which means when translated, son of comfort, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, possessing a certain piece of land, sold it and bought the money and deposited it at the feet of the apostles. It appears that Barnabas came in the truth on the day of Pentecost. He was one, one of those foreign people who heard the message spoken in his own tongue. If it wasn't in the day of Pentecost, it was within that week. You know, when it said within another day or two, it was added to five, grew to 5,000. He was within the first 5,000, but most probably in the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. He owned land around Jerusalem, and he was one who sold it and brought the whole money and gave it to the apostles. Now, can you imagine someone today who uh, had some land, had a house, and he sold a lot and then gave the lot to the society and then had nothing for himself? What sort of a man would you think he'd have to be? Fairly selfless, generous, and concerned with the work. Now, this is Barnabas. Remember, Ananias and Sapphira were going to do the same thing. It goes on in that chap next chapter, and they kept some for themselves. They lost their lives over it. So Barnabas was a big man. He was generous, had a big heart. He was a great lover of Jehovah God and very staunch for the truth. But his main quality happened to be whenever anyone was sad, when anyone was downhearted, when anyone was depressed, if anyone was discouraged, send for Barnabas. Joseph would go along and he could comfort them. He would comfort anybody. You, you had a visit from him when you had a fit of the blues and when he, he, you, he went away, your heart would be way up here again and you'd be as happy as could be. He was so good at it that they actually called him Son of Comfort. And that's where the name Barnabas came from. He was one of the few who was surnamed by the Apostle and then became better known by his nickname than even was known by his real name. I bet most of, I suppose most of us didn't even know that his name was really Joseph. So there we, we have it. I've given up Betty. Sorry about that. My stumbling stone. I'll step on it. <laughs> Now, Barnabas, if we, uh, the interesting thing about it, he came into the truth before the Apostle Paul, so we get that straight. He was instrumental in helping the Apostle Paul. When Paul came down to Jerusalem to, to, and he wanted to get an interview with the twelve apostles, they didn't want to talk to him because he'd been murdering all the Christians and he wasn't the kind of fellow that they wanted to have come in. They thought he might have been still spying or something. And guess who it was that went into the Apostle's talked to the apostles, felt sorry for this poor Saul of Tarsus, mm. went in, talked to the apostles, spoke on, the, on his behalf, went out and got him and took him in to the apostles. Who would do a thing like that? None other than Barnabas. That's the kind of a man he was. When you look a little further in the Bible about the uh, congregation up in Antioch, it mentions, I guess this is about in 13 of Acts, it mentions... <coughs> Incidentally, if you're writing down scriptures and you want to know where it was that Barnabas led Paul into the apostles, it's in Acts 9, 26 and 27. But now in Acts chapter 13, you'll notice here that it says, Now in Antioch, this is verse 1, there were prophets and teachers in the local congregation. And on the top of the list is a man called... See? Number one was... Barnabas. And if you keep looking down that list, you'll see that at the bottom of the list was the Saul, or Paul. Now, when the Holy Spirit asked them to be put aside for preaching, whose name it was mentioned first? Can you see it in the next verse, in verse 2? Of all persons set Barnabas and Saul apart. Not Saul and Barnabas at all. 
Barnabas was determined to take along also John, called Mark. But Paul did not think it proper to be taking this one along with them, seeing that he had departed from them from Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. At this, there occurred a sharp burst of anger, so that they separated from each other. And Barnabas took Mark along and sailed away to Cyprus. And Paul selected Silas and went off after he'd been entrusted by the brothers to the undeserved kindness of Jehovah. So now here is a split up. And uh, the background to this is rather interesting, of course. The Mark that is referred to, John Mark, is Mark the Bible writer. The, he is a cousin of Barnabas. Now, if you know about John Mark, uh, he used to live in Jerusalem. His parents were well off, and uh, he was reared with what we would say today a silver spoon in his mouth. He um, had everything he wanted, three meals a day, even a bed to sleep in, and all of these fancy things. And uh, it was a place where the apostles used to come. Peter used to come, Paul used to call in, everyone used to call in at the home of John Mark and he was a young lad growing up and in his teens he used to hear the exciting story of how they were out in missionary work and sleeping out, and it sounds exciting doesn't it, sleeping out till you try it, and uh, sleeping out un under the stars and, and how they were preaching and all the things and how they got chased by wild animals and how robbers came out and they just escaped and you know how young people get excited about such things and so he said, please, 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 can I go? Can I go? Let, please let me go. And Paul's a bit dubious about it. Barnabas was his cousin and they said, all right, you can come. So they set off. And you know what it's like trying to keep up with the Apostle Paul on a missionary tour? Don't ever do it. You won't have the opportunity. But uh, see, he was a little wiry man. You know, they don't ever eat and do anything like anyone else. They just go, you know, and everything they touch turns to energy and they gallop day and night. Well, this was Paul. You know, there is an account in the Bible where the, to give you an idea of the way the Apostle Paul viewed food and sleep and such things, uh, where it mentions that Paul sat down to have dinner one evening, say 7.30. They all were sitting around. At 12 midnight, he had not touched his tea. He'd not eaten a bite because he'd been talking. And it was at midnight, remember, that Eutychus fell out the window, down three floors, and was killed. Paul hasn't touched his food. Now, you can imagine if that happened today, right? Some, you invite some brother to a meal, they're all sitting there, the sister cooks all the meal, puts it on the table, and there he sits for about four and a half hours and doesn't even touch it. Apparently some sister had some good fruits of the spirit too. What would we be doing? We'd be out in the back kitchen saying, oh, that, that's gratitude for you. Know, I cooked that meal, but I got it already, but he won't even eat it. Look at that. He's letting it go cold. He won't even touch his meal. Like, what's he going to be going all that trouble? And, you know, our sons, not you, of course, but our sons' sisters might react to that situation. But obviously, uh, she didn't. So, uh, Paul goes down and he resurrects Eutychus, all in a day's work, brings him back up. It's now midnight, so it says then he ate his meal was cold and whatever it was by this time of the night, but he just ate it, kept on talking until daylight. At daylight, did he go to bed? No, it said he got up and he left on a missionary tour. So now we understand what Paul said when he said, in sleepless nights often, in abstinence from food many times. Now, here's John Mark going with the Apostle Paul. John Mark never missed a meal in his life. He's always been in bed by 8 o'clock every night. And here they are marching along and his legs are aching, everything's aching, he's out of condition and uh, he's hungry and he feels as though he's going to die. And he says to the Apostle Paul, 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 uh, uh, where, where's an, an inn? Are we going to stop for lunch, you know, and, and somewhere? And Paul says, lunch? lunch? What do you mean lunch? I've never heard of the thing. Uh, you know, uh, have a drink of water and tighten your belt and let's keep walking. So it comes nightfall, and, and uh, he's dragging behind them like this, and, and uh, Paul sa he says to Paul, where's the inn that we're going to sleep at tonight? And Paul says, inn? Inn? What do you mean inn? We're going to sleep over there under that fence. 
that bit of a hedge that's growing there. And he says, we're going to what? Uh, so they go over and they lie down and, and they, it's dark. And, and he's never been out, you know, in the dark. And he hears the animals calling and the silence. And his little heart starts to pound. And he says, Paul, you awake, Paul? Paul, you awake? And Paul says, yes, I'm awake. What's the problem? Paul, I'm cold. Oh, Paul says, that's a great idea. Let's get up and keep walking. That'll warm you up. <laughs> and so uh, you can see what would happen. Didn't worry, Paul. So they kept going and they kept going. And one day, poor John Mark couldn't stand it any longer. And he said, Paul, I want to go home. <laughs> and Paul said, you want to what? And he said, I want to go home. He said, look. They had to stop and they had to detour right over to the seaport and load him on a boat to send him back to Jerusalem. All the trouble, you see. And now the, this situation develops. He and Paul, Paul and Barnabas want to go back. And Barnabas says, let's take Mark with us. Paul said, what? He said, let's take Mark. He said, over my dead body, I wouldn't take that boy with us. Look how he slowed us down last time and all the trouble he caused us. No, no, I wouldn't take him. Barnabas says, I'm taking him. He's a good lad. He's got the makings of a good missionary. He learned from his past mistake. And I want to take him with us. Paul said, no, you're not taking him. Barnabas said, I'm taking him. He said, you're not taking him. I'm taking him. He said, well, he said, if you're taking him, you're on your own. And Barnabas said, that suits me fine. I'm on my own. Okay, I'll take him. And, and he and I'll go, and you and, can take Sylvanus, and you can go where you want. A sharp burst of anger occurred. Right. Guess who was standing there listening to that conversation? Mark. Do you think that made him feel ten foot tall? How do you think he felt about the Apostle Paul? Well, brothers and sisters, do you know how the story ever ended? Rather, in an interesting way, very slightly mentioned in the Bible, in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 10. The outcome of the whole thing, where it says, Paul signs off the letter, Aristarchus, my fellow captive, sends you his greetings, and so does so does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Guess who was with the Apostle Paul now? Mark. Now how do you think that reconciliation took place? Can you imagine whatever happened? One day, the Apostle Paul had to say to Mark, Look, Mark, I misjudged you. Sorry about that. Uh, you uh, have turned out to be an excellent missionary. And uh, I was wrong. I'd love you to come with me. Now it's Mark's turn. Now if he was like us, what might he say? No. I'm not going. Why should I go? You didn't have any faith in me before. Barnabas, my cousin, he had faith in me. You didn't have any faith in me. And you didn't want me. And you didn't want to train me. And now that I can do it, now you want to take me. No, I'm not going. I'm not going to go because you didn't want me before. Is that how we might react? Not these Christians, they knew what it was like. No doubt, Mark very generously just said, I understand how you felt, Paul. I was a nuisance to you. I was determined to make good. It would be a real privilege to go with you. And so that's why they were together again. Is it any wonder that the Apostle Paul might have written in that same book of the Bible, just across the page in verse 12 of chapter 3, Accordingly as God's chosen ones, holy and loved, Clothe yourselves with the tender affections of compassion, kindness, lowliness of mind, mildness, and long-suffering. Continue putting up with one another and forgiving one another freely if anyone has a cause for complaint against another. Even as Jehovah freely forgave you, so do you also. But besides all these things, clothe yourselves with love, for it is a perfect bond of union. They practiced it. They had their ups and downs. They had their personalities also with having the rough edges knocked off, just as we do today. And this is the remedy. This is why they are able to do it. This was why they are able to turn what appeared to be insurmountable stumbling stones into tremendous stepping stones. 
things that instead of them looking back with regret upon, they could look back upon as being an important part of their Christian growth and development. Our dear Apostle Peter used to often do the wrong thing, not because he was any worse than anyone else, but he was warm-hearted. He was outgoing, he was generous. And the Apostle Peter spoke him uh, spontaneously from his very heart. So sometimes that tongue got him in trouble. But then the Bible says if you, ha- if you haven't stumbled with your tongue at some time, you're a perfect man. So we all do the same thing, don't we? The Apostle Peter, uh, according to what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, made an error in which he actually when having Barnabas with him on one occasion, began to eat meat uh, with the, or certain foods, I uh, just we better check that to see what it was that they were doing. And uh, he, when he began to, he was eating this meat with the Gentile, and when the Jews came up, the Jewish Christians, he was with the Gentile Christians, you see, it was no problem. And uh, in uh, chapter 2 of Galatians, Chapter 11, it says, However, when Cephas came to Antioch, I resisted him face to face because he stood condemned. For before the arrival of certain men from James, that's Jewish Christians from Jerusalem, he used to eat with the people of the nations. But when they arrived, he went withdrawing and separating himself in fear of those of the circumcised class. The rest of the Jews also joined him in putting on this pretense so that even Barnabas was led along with them in this pretense. So now uh, we have the situation. Um, Peter was happy to be mixing with the Gentiles, and then some Jews arrived up there, and then he made out that he wasn't associating with the Gentiles. He was only having anything to do with the Jews. And the Apostle Paul, with the usual Pauline tact, which is generally hit him down the head with a 4B2, says, he withstood Peter face to face. So Paul walks up to Peter and says, Peter, you are a hypocrite. You stand condemned. You are putting on a putting on a pretense. You are leading Barnabas and the other Jews into the same pretense. You are an apostle. You are putting on a pretense. You're a hypocrite. And you are making out your one thing one time and doing something else. And, and Well, that isn't the way to win, win friends and influence people, is it? How do you think Peter would have uh, reacted? But it wasn't only that. It wasn't only that. You know what Paul did? He sat down and he wrote a letter to all the congregations in the district of Galatia and told them about it. Now that's a pretty big thing, isn't it? You can imagine that. Have you ever been a hypocrite? you ever sort of put on a bit of a pretense sometimes and make out you're better than you are and so on? We do a bit, don't we? Uh, don't tell everyone about it, but we could all be found guilty of it from time to time. Now, what about if a brother came up to you and he said, you're a bit of a hypocrite, aren't you? Piro, how dare you? <laughs> he says to you, well, um, uh, you did this and that and something else. And uh, then you say, oh, yes, I was wrong. I, I shouldn't have. But then he sits down, he writes a letter to the society and tells them they publish it in the watchtower. Sister so-and-so was caught playing the hypocrite and she got told off and so on. How would you feel? And it went all around. And then you had to go to the convention. You had to look at people. And then they met you and saw you in the public. Oh, you're the one in the watchtower. Oh, yes, you're the, you're the hypocrite. Here's what I remember about you, you know. <laughs> You'd be walking around. You'd have facelifts, hair changes, wearing your lapel card backwards and all sorts of things, wouldn't you? What a terrible thing to happen. That's what happened to Peter. Here he was an apostle, one of the governing body, and the apostle Paul wrote this letter and sent all around and told everybody exactly what he did. Now, what sort of a man was Peter? Peter is is understood to be a very big man, and he must have had a heart at least as big as Barnabas's, mustn't he? And you know that he accepted that correction. He also wrote letters and appeared to the same people, he stood up before them, they all knowing his fault and all knowing his weakness, 
He remained on the governing body, remained faithful to God, and we understand that when it came time for him to die, they wanted to impale him because of the way that he had faithfully served Jesus Christ, his master, and they said, right, if you're so keen on him, we'll impale you the same way as your master was impaled. And Peter said, no, thank you. I'm not worthy of being impaled the way he was impaled. So they said, all right, we'll hang you upside down. And it was understood that Peter was impaled, hanging upside down till the blood ran to his brain and burst his brain. And it's understood how Peter died. Now this was the big man who had had all this written about him all around but was man enough to know that he was serving God and to stand up in front of the brothers just the same. When he had something to say about the Apostle Paul, he didn't stumble over that situation. He allowed it to be a stepping stone for him to correct his personality and any problems that he had in it. And he accepted his best friend as being whom? The Apostle Paul, and in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, he refers to Paul in these words, Furthermore, consider the patience of our Lord of salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul has written you in all his letters. Our beloved brother Paul. After Paul writing all that about him and correcting him, our beloved brother Paul. Do you not see that Peter was able to see that that, that might have been a major stepping stone in the lives of us was, the, uh, was the, not a stumbling stone but really a stepping stone. He used it as such. His personality changed. He accepted it and has been molded accordingly. And now, of course, you know that those brothers are in heaven and in their heavenly position and ruling, both Barnabas, Paul, and Peter, and all as a part of the heavenly kingship arrangement. So brothers and sisters, when you stop and think about these situations that develop, and they will continue to develop, how are you going to react? It's all right to talk about it when it's someone else. What about the next time somebody hurts your feelings? The next time someone walks on your toes? The next time someone rubs you up the wrong way? How are you going to react? Are you going to say, well, how can I be impatient if I have sufficient patience? This person upsets me. How can I be upset if I have self-control? How can I be upset if I'm not given to fits of anger? How can you be hurt if you have all the fruits of the Spirit? And if you are hurt, which ones of the fruits of the Spirit don't you have? Are you oversensitive? That is also a problem, isn't it? Well, then that has to be corrected. But brothers and sisters, whatever it is, in any situation, in any dealing with one another, don't think how she made you feel, but just think about what do you now learn? What is God trying to teach you from this situation? What is, what is the lesson in this for me from God? If Jehovah is finishing our training, trying to get us to be fire-resistant Christians so that we can survive. Where are the lessons? Can you see them? You can see them, can't you? I know that after this talk is over, you'll realize that you've had, you have more friends in this congregation than you've ever realized. And all the people that you thought that you didn't like, they are your very best friends. And, uh, but don't hug them straight away after because it'll show which ones they were, won't it? But there they are, your dear brothers and sisters who inadvertently without any control of their own, are also stones in the same barrel, being also ground and polished to the glory of the same God. So the 91st Psalm tells us, uh, which you might read in, in length at some time because of its beauty, but we might just say that why you can't stumble, uh, other matters aside, it says, anyone dwelling in the secret place of the Most High will procure himself lodging under the very shadow of the Almighty One. I will say to Jehovah, you are my refuge and my stronghold, my God in whom I will trust. Now it goes on to say, as you read down in verse 9, because you said Jehovah is my refuge, you've made the Most High himself your dwelling, no calamity will befall you, and not even a plague will draw near to your tent. For he will give his own angels a command concerning you, 
to guard you in all your ways. Upon their hands they will carry you that you may not strike your foot against any stone. You can't be stumbled while you make the Most High himself your dwelling. Brothers and sisters, do you know that even, even an oyster has enough brains to know how to deal with situations? And I guess you wouldn't like to think you haven't got the same brains as an oyster. If you get an oyster and you uh, open his mouth or his back door or whatever you call it, uh, his shell, take a tiny grain of sand and place inside the oyster's mouth and shut his, the door again, it will irritate the oyster no end. He gets terribly upset and frustrated. And you know what he does? He doesn't sit there and let himself be frustrated. But he looks at that irritation and he says to himself, I'm going to work on that. And he gets to work on it. And he works and works and works and works and he stops and he looks at it and he says, well, that even irritates me. So he works some more and he keeps going and going and going. And one day you open that up and you know what's in there? A beautiful pearl. And it's made out of an irritation by an irritated oyster. And in fact, brothers and sisters, when you are irritated... At least have the brains of an oyster. At least work on it and say, why am I irritated? What can I do? And build something from it. And so that irritation will be remembered and will be demonstrated as a beautiful pearl in your character. And there we have the illustration of the stone. You are in a big barrel being ground so that you can reflect more the beauty and the light of Jehovah God. And other people, of course, are rubbing, rubbing some rough edges off you. Cut and polished to the glory of God, according to Haggai chapter 2. You are being irritated from time to time, but Jehovah God hopes that you have the wisdom of the oyster and you might make it into a beautiful pearl. We have opportunities then to de demonstrate and to learn the fruits of the Spirit before it's too late and to be fire-resistant Christians at the time when Jehovah God wants to test us on that, in that regard. And so we read finally in Psalm 119, 165, that as far as these stumbling stones are concerned, it says there, abundant peace belongs to those loving your law, and for them there is no stumbling block. So brothers and sisters, love God more, make him your refuge, make him your strength, Turn all your stumbling stones into stepping stones.